Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming here. Now, uh, I'm a technologist. Uh, as Mike pointed out, I've been a teacher, uh, and I've been a lifelong learner. But uh, before this meeting, I had no real contact with the official learning technology discipline. And so I was rather apprehensive when I uh, got the invitation from SEP to come here and talk. I said, gee, you know, before I could do that, I'd probably have to read 10 or 20 years worth of research papers just to catch up, to be able to, to talk to you guys, and that seemed kind of intimidating. Uh, but then I was very encouraged uh, when I talked to uh, this friend of mine, Hal Apelson, a uh, professor at MIT, an educator, author of uh, probably the world's best book on computer programming, and he told me, you only need to read one paper. So, so that was a big relief. I figured that was a reading assignment that uh, I could catch up with, and so I was able to accept uh, SEP's invitation. And this is one paper that Hal told me to read. It's a paper by Benjamin Bloom from 1984 uh, on what he calls the, the two sigma problem. And you probably can't read that very well, uh, but uh, what he points out is uh, a comparison that he and his students had done of three different uh, learning methods. So the first is what he calls conventional teaching in which uh, students have the subject matter in a class with about 30 students per teacher, and the teacher lectures and gives texts uh, in the way that we're used to. Then he compared that uh, with a model of uh, Bloom's called uh, mastery learning. And there the idea is you do the same kind of lecturing, but instead of having tests to separate out the good students from the bad students, you keep on testing until the students actually get things right. And so you test to identify what their errors are, then you go back, re-teach re them on that, and have them keep going until they learn all the material. Uh, and then, so, so the second approach is uh, more teacher-intensive and more personalized, and therefore uh, more expensive. And as uh, Dylan, Dylan Williams was pointing out, in the, uh, in the previous keynote, this is something that perhaps we don't have the resources to do. Maybe this is too expensive for us. And then the third approach is the one-on-one -on -one tutoring approach, which we know is, is too expensive. Uh, the results that Bloom came up with in this study uh, was that this, uh, there were significant effects to uh, both these augmentations. And he says you get about one standard deviation of improvement from using the mastery learning and two full standard deviations from using the one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So according to Bloom, we have the answer to how to make our students succeed. It's just that we can't afford it. And now the challenge is, is there something else that we can do that's going to be as effective as one-on-one -on -one tutoring that uh, uh, uses some other kind of technology. In 1984, we didn't have all the technology that was available to us today. Is there something else we can do now uh, that can answer Bloom's challenge from, some, from so long ago? So first, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly conventional learning is like and then contrast that with, with some of the other possibilities. So I learned a little from another educator, uh, Frank Rhodes, ex-president of Cornell, who said, in the basic business of teaching resident students, universities have not diverged much from the method of Socrates, except that most faculty members have now moved inside. <laughs> so what do we know about Socrates? Well, maybe he had uh, reasons for thinking that being inside could be a corrupting influence. <laughs> Uh, so he did indeed like to teach outside, uh, and uh, we know that he's famous for this questioning approach, that he used questions uh, in many ways. Well, one was to keep the inquiry focused on what he thought was the, the lesson to be learned. Another was to keep it appropriate and personalized to a learner. Uh, another, he used it in sort of a bullying way to uh, uh, kind of show the learner that he really knew what was going on, but wasn't able to, uh, to tear it out himself. So... Uh, uh, maybe some uh, marks off for harassment there. Uh, but it was a, a, a different time. But, I no but note that in this one-on-one -on -one questioning uh, interaction, uh, Socrates is really much more like a tutor and not like a conventional teacher. So, so Rhodes was really wrong. It, it's not that we haven't moved forward 
at all from Socrates over 2,000 years. It's that we've moved backwards from this tutoring approach to a non-tutoring approach that's not as effective. So now let's uh, fast forward a millennium and a half. Here we are. This is conventional learning in the year 1350. Now, the lecture was a fantastic innovation in 1350 because books were very expensive things that had to be made by hand, by monks, so you couldn't really afford to give them to all the students. Uh, but in a lecture, one person could read this material and get it into the minds of all the students at once. It was the broadcasting of the time. Uh, now, you'd think that uh, although it was a great technology for 1350, by 100 years later, lecture probably should have died out because there was a new learning technology that this guy Gutenberg came up with where it became cheap to have these books. So why have this one guy in the front of the class reading from it when all the students could be reading from it simultaneously? Now, I'll leave it to the historians to sort out why that didn't happen, why the lecture didn't die out in uh, 1480 or so. And I'll concentrate just on the problems with lectures and note that uh, we don't need any of today's technologies and studies, although there have been plenty uh, well-documented studies. Uh, we can just go back to 1350, and they've identified the problem right here. It's this guy. <laughs> so, so even in 1350, we knew that attention wanders when you lecture. People fall asleep, and you can look around at the other people in the room, and only about a third of them are really paying attention. The others, if they're not sleeping, they're starting to nod off or they're talking to their neighbors. Uh, that's what happens. Now, in places where educational results really matter, regulations are actually put in place to limit lectures. So, for example, in the United States, Federal Aviation Administration is responsible for the teaching of pilots, and they put in regulations that say no lecture can be longer than 20 minutes maximum. Why do they do that? Because they know if they don't, that's what happens. So they found out that there were bad results, and they put regulations in place to, uh, to take care of that. Uh, unfortunately, in other industries where maybe a, a lapse in attention is not as uh, dramatic, uh, the lecture survives unregulated. Now, I noticed that this particular enlightened conference for uh, most of the sessions does respect the 20-minute limit. Uh, Unfortunately, there is one exception to that. That's the keynotes. <laughs> so that bodes ill. Uh, we'll just have to hope for the best. Uh, you know, we're, we're only about eight minutes into the talk, so you know, maybe catch about five minutes more, then wander out, talk to your friends, and come back at the end. And I'll try to stop early and leave plenty of times for a more effective method of interactive uh, talk. Okay. Um, so that's one of the big problems with lectures is that you just can't do it too long. Uh, or it starts to get stale. There's another problem with it, in that the lecture is suited only to the oral learning style. And now we know that there are multiple methods of learning, and, and as an aside, uh, I was glad when I went to my uh, daughter's uh, third grade uh, parent introduction night where the teacher explained what was going to go on in the classroom, and she started to talk about these different kinds of learning styles. And the teacher said, well, you know, we recognize that some of the kids are visual. Uh, they respond to written words and diagrams. Some are oral. They respond to spoken words and music. Some are tactile. They re respond to body movements and touch. And we try to individualize the instruction to be, to be appropriate to each child and the modality that they prefer. And I thought, this is great. Here's a teacher that's making use of the latest research. Uh, my child's going to get a good education. And then she went on and, and she said, and in fact, you can diagnose which type of learner each student is just by listening to how they talk. And she says, you know, if you're a visual learner, you'll say things like, I see what you're saying. If you're oral, you'll say things like, I hear you. And if you're tactile, you'll say things like, I feel that you're right. And I was thinking, nah. <laughs> you know, if it was that easy. Uh, but that can't be right. And, and then I was heartened uh, when Google hired this guy, uh, T.V. Raman, who's uh, a very well noted and respected uh, engineer, happens to be blind. And within my first five minutes of talking to him after he was hired, he said, ah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> 
so, uh, so I think my intuition was right on that one. And it still is difficult to diagnose exactly what learning style uh, a student is using. And uh, they may prefer different ones at, at different times. Uh, but it's right that you don't want to you don't want to rely on a modality that uh, just goes after one of those styles. So that's another problem with lecture. Now, uh, one more thing about the lecture or, or the uh, conventional approach uh, is that it lacks portability. Portability, and let's compare it to another form of delivering information: the musical performance. Now, back in 1530, if you if you wanted to hear a lecture. Well, you were lucky if there was one place to go to hear a lecture within a day's uh, hike, uh, and that's what you were stuck with. Now, if you wanted to hear music, you probably had a few more choices, but basically it was whatever troubadours happened to be in town, you could go and listen to them perform music, or you could perform it yourself with your friends and family. Um, now, uh, in the modern world, of course, here in the 21st century, if you want music, you're no longer stuck with your local troubadour. You have thousands of choices, and you can get the very best performances by the very best musicians in any genre you want replayed at any time. Uh, but contrast to that to what's happened with lecture. So uh, if you want to hear a lecture, up until the very final years of the 20th century, you only had the choice of the live performance. You had to hike down to your local performance place, which is a university, and, and hear the lectures there. Now, of course, in the last few years, that has become a little bit more portable, and you uh, can shift in time the lectures uh, uh, from your local university. You can even get some lectures from universities around the world. But we've not moved to this model where there are star performers. You know, we, we could have imagined uh, a model where if you want to learn about linguistics, you said, who's the best linguist? Oh, it's this guy Pinker. I'm going to go get him, put him on my iPod. I'm not going to be stuck with uh, whoever happens to be at the local university. But for some reason, we didn't go down this route, and, and I can't really explain why. OK, so let's look at which learning technologies might help solve the two sigma problems. So we saw the problem with the uh, conventional approach, with the lecture-based approach, uh, how can we get away from that towards the tutoring-based model without all the expense of hiring a separate tutor, tutor for every student? Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that uh, Google is doing in this area as representative of the kinds of technologies. Of course, this conference has, has covered many others. Uh, so we're going to start off with the sort of more formal approaches and then move to the informal and think about uh, why they may actually be a better approach. OK. So uh, first thing is uh, Google is offering these uh, Google Applications Education Edition. So that's uh, free email, chat, calendars, web pages, and documents, and branded with your uh, university, your educational institute, uh, and help in putting it all together. And uh, up until uh, two days ago, I thought that this was just a collection of online applications. But uh, now I know that if you integrate it all pop properly, it's actually called a virtual learning environment. <laughs> OK. Um, now here's a little uh, sketch on the back of a napkin that was drawn by uh, Adrian Sanier, who's uh, in the uh, IT office at Arizona State University. And he called this uh, light technology for an advanced alien culture. And so what did he mean? Well, he noticed, uh, as you see on the left here, that there was this increasing gap. So he, as an as a information officer at a university, said, you know, we've got limited budgets. We can only spend so much. And it seems like every year, the, the best of industry, the highest technology, gets farther and farther away from us. And we can't spend enough to keep up. Uh, but he said, but if we move to this model on the right, where instead of us trying to buy our own technology every year, we ally with a partner, now we're suddenly we're on our partner's growth curve rather than our own growth curve, and we can go as far as they go. And so that's the approach he's taken. Uh, you can see there's uh, lots of things that come with this that you can get help with. So you can, uh, uh, there are tools at the school level, like setting up a website, and there's tools at the classroom level like planning a lesson using Google Earth Maps. Uh, and this is in uh, a partnership with Amnesty International, one of the lessons plans we provide. And there's many other uh, types of lessons available. OK. 
Uh, now, here's another partnership, and this is fairly new, uh, just, just launched uh, last week. We didn't talk about it much, uh, but we've teamed up with Creative Commons and with the uh, Packard Foundation from Hewlett Packard to create an index of all open courseware. So uh, any university or, or other institution that publishes their course on the web can find their way into this index, and we'll search it and give you back the results. Uh, so here you see a search for solar energy. You get the uh, MIT course uh, first. I mean, that's appropriate. They're, you know, they're a good engineering school, and they're at the forefront of this uh, open courseware movement, so maybe they deserve to be first. Uh, then uh, there's other results uh, from uh, World Watch, from other schools, and so on, a uh, combination of different results that you can browse through and see these educational materials. And this is useful both for the teacher in trying to put together a new course of their own uh, and for the students in trying to supplement the course they're taking and for the home learner who wants to put together their own course. Okay, so that's one option. Um, many of you are probably uh, familiar with Scholar. Uh, uh, so here's an opportunity to search over academic journals. So if I search for Ivory Bill Woodpecker, uh, I can see a recent journal article that, uh, from science that uh, caused a lot of excitement. I can see a, an older uh, book that, that uh, uh, talks about some of the background behind it and, and so on, a uh, collection of articles. Uh, but some, some of our users are not familiar with Scholar, so this is not a destination that they would go to. It's, it's sort of hidden to them or not available to them. And so one of the things we've been doing recently is trying to uh, bring all our results to uh, all our users without them having to know where to go to. Uh, so if you know to go to Scholar, great. That's what you want. You're in good shape. But if you don't know, we still want to get you the right mix of uh, scholarly and non-scholarly material. Uh, so here's an example of a search using the, the normal uh, Google search uh, for Bigtable, which is uh, uh, implementation that some of our engineers have come up with for a uh, uh, very large type of database uh, table used over parallel machines. Uh, and there's a mixture of results here. So there's uh, papers that would have been in Scholar, these academic papers. There's a Wikipedia entry. And uh, the third entry there, there's a video, uh, and then some blogs, and then some uh, more academic papers, and so on. And the point is that if you thought about this on your own and tried to narrow where you were going to search, you know, you probably would have said, well, this is an academic type thing. I'll go to Scholar. I'll look there. Uh, but then you would have missed the video and, and some of these other entries. You, you probably wouldn't have thought first that uh, uh, video is the kind of thing that's associated with this kind of query, but in fact, we have the engineer who designed the system uh, giving a technical talk, and that's probably exactly the kind of thing you want. So in some cases, you can be outsmarting yourself by going, narrowing yourself down to a specific search. Okay. And of course, uh, you know, regular Google search works pretty well as uh, finding subject matter for a course as well. All right, so all those things are available and they're available for the teacher, for the formal student, and for the informal student. Now let's get back again to um, Bloom's challenge and uh, remember what he said, that the average student under tutoring was two standard deviations above the control, uh, and try to understand exactly what that means, because it really is quite extraordinary. So uh, standard bell-shaped curve, the control by definition, 50% are above the mean, if you define things uh, just right, and you can say that uh, being beyond two standard deviations means doing really well, then 2% are doing really well. Uh, now, when you move to mastery le learning, things are shifted approximately one standard deviation to the right. Uh, you can see the uh, outline bump there, uh, getting a little bit of separation uh, from the control, uh, but maybe not that much, but still, uh, quite a change in that now 84% are above the control mean and 16% are doing really well. So if you multiply by eight the number of uh, people that are doing really well. 
Once you go to tutoring, two standard deviations, now you really got a big uh, advantage. You can see the two humps are widely separated. 98% uh, of the students are above average, and 50% are into this range of doing well. So, so that's an extraordinary accomplishment if it really holds up. Uh, some more numbers from the paper. Uh, in the control, the conventional teaching, students were on task 65% uh, of the time. So essentially one third of the time uh, their attention span was wandering. Uh, if you believe the uh, research paper represented by that 1350 painting, it was more like two thirds of the time uh, attention was wandering. So uh, I'm not sure which one to believe, but we'll go with Bloom for the moment. Once you switch to mastery learning, you pick up a little bit of that time back, so now 75% time on task. Tutoring, you've got 90%, so you really got their attention, and maybe that's where most of the gains come from. Uh, Bloom also reported these correlation numbers, so uh, in conventional teaching, there's a .60 correlation between the aptitude, so that's the before you give the course, you test them for kind of background knowledge, and the achievement, the results of taking the course. So that's saying, you know, 60% of uh, the result is determined before you even get started. You're, you're just uh, kind of allowing the top students to stay at the, at the top uh, as much as pushing them on. With mastery learning, the correlation goes down to 0.35 and with tutoring down to 0.25. Uh, so in part, that's saying uh, everybody has a fairer chance to advance. In part, it may also just be a sort of a statistical artifact because if everybody is squished off to the right, then they all have about the same score. So now the correlations disappear because everybody's doing excellent. Uh, now, in the paper, Bloom had four main suggestions on what you could do to achieve uh, these two sigma without tutoring. Uh, one, he said, careful review of previous material. For example, if you're teaching an Algebra two class, make sure you go back over the Algebra one material and do this with what he called enhanced cues, participation, and reinforcement, which is just a sort of sneaky way of getting the tutoring back in. It's going over these materials, seeing who's getting it and not getting it, and if they're not getting it, giving them special attention. Uh, he also said a student support system, which groups of two or three students study together, worked well. Of course, this was back in the days when everything was done offline, maybe more effective now done online. Uh, special programs for reading and study skills, a, a sort of this remedial program. And he said that computer learning can work, but only for very motivated students. And maybe that has changed now as well. So let's look a little bit at what kids today are doing really well, or out there on the right past the uh, two sigma mark. And there's an, a number of ways you can achieve this kind of, kind of level of high achievement. Uh, so some kids do really well on computer-based training materials, and this is a slide from this uh, site called Hey Math, and they provide this uh, uh, computer-based training for algebra, and Dylan, Dylan William talked about a similar program at CMU. Uh, he said it took, it's, uh, the results are very effective, but it took 20 years to develop. And so there are a few subjects, uh, like algebra, where it seems like it makes sense to put in that uh, 20 years effort, or however much effort it, it takes, uh, because you want its complex material, uh, but it's very self-contained, and you can sort of put together the materials once and for all and really nail it, and then you can teach it to a lot of students. And so I think there are these few areas where that makes sense, but for most areas it probably doesn't make sense. And even for things uh, like algebra, you have to think about how well this, uh, these materials you put together are going to port to different kinds of students. So for example, this lesson uh, seems like it will work well for somebody who's a football fan, uh, but you know, what about this kid? And say he prefers baseball, or, or this kid uh, who likes cricket better. Uh, or this kid who doesn't actually know anything about organized sports, but he's been herding and counting his family's sheep since the time he was four years old. Right? So these are all very different uh, types of learners, uh, maybe trying to fit them all into the same funnel of uh, computer-based training with a specific theme is not going to work that well. Okay. So what other kids are doing well? So here's a kid who had a good summer. I don't know how much you heard about him uh, over here, but in the, 
in the States, he was hot. So this is a 17-year-old high school kid who, uh, in his spare time over the summer, unlocked the iPhone, uh, traded the result for a car, and then packed off to, to go off to college. And it's, he said he spent a few hundreds of hours, and he had the help of a few online friends. So this is just the exact opposite of computer-based algebra training. Uh, there's no lesson plan. In fact, there couldn't be a lesson plan because before this guy did it, nobody knew how to accomplish uh, what he tried to do. Maybe the Apple engineers did, but they weren't telling. Uh, there's no real theory behind it. It's all practice. And uh, I guess actually there is some theory, but he learned it as he went along. So uh, when he started out, he was pretty handy with a soldering iron. That gave him the confidence to get started. Uh, he got into it. He soon realized, gee, there's a bunch of this software stuff I'm going to have to know. I don't know much about that. Uh, but I got some friends online, and maybe they can help me. And they, maybe they can lead me in the right direction. And together, they started to work on it. He learned what he needed to know. Uh, it was collaborative. It was just in time learning. And again, it comes back, the tutoring was sneaking in. He was being tutored, whether he knew it or not, by his friends. And he was tutored. You know, they taught him about software. He taught them about soldering. And between the group of them, they were able to come up with the answer. So that's a successful result. Uh, is it uh, duplicatable? Well, I don't know. Is, is he an exceptional kid, or, or was he just lucky? Or was it just the determination to get started on a project that was important rather than any attributes that he had to have? I don't know. Uh, here's another example. This is Olin College. Uh, so this is a college that's really dedicated to every kid having this uh, kind of iPod-like experience. So it's a, a new college. They just graduated their first graduating class last year. It's an engineering college uh, located in Boston. Uh, and the idea is that instead of theory-heavy lectures and segregated disciplines and individual efforts, uh, they go after design exercises and interdisciplinary studies and teamwork. And the curriculum integrates these disciplines with practical projects. Uh, so it's a do-and-learn approach. The uh, pr uh, president is shown here. President Miller said, uh, students start out with an audacious project, which would in many institutions be heretical, except we do that deliberately. Uh, because after all, when you get hired in a corporation, that's the first thing that happens to you. They give you a challenge for which you've not had the prerequisites, and it's about learning how to learn. So we do that here from day one. Okay. So this was uh, the first assignment for the freshman class coming in. So they divided the students into small groups, and they assigned them the task of, in eight weeks, uh, designing, building, and demonstrating uh, pulse oximeter. So that's this little device that you clip onto your finger, and it tells you your pulse, and it tells you your uh, blood oxygen levels without uh, pricking your skin. Um, and so the professors showed the groups a commercial unit, and then they referred them to some patents and some technical documentation. Uh, and then the faculty's plan was to watch the students and see where they failed and stepped in and guide them towards a solution. And the problem was they never failed. Uh, they just got started. They said, we understand what this problem is. We understand what we don't know. And they went off, and they tried to learn it. Uh, in eight weeks, all the, all the teams got the project done. And one of the side effects was that was at the end of eight weeks, they were now receptive for this theory that they didn't have. So in other classes, you know, you would have spent two years learning about the theory of transistors and so on before they let you do a project. Here, they skipped all that, said, threw them into the deep end of the pool, said, go ahead and do the project. They learned just enough to know, but at the end of that eight weeks, they said, you know, I'm really interested in transistors now. I, I want to know some of that theory. And then they started to teach uh, the theory behind it. OK, uh, one more example. This is probably cheating, because this is from uh, science fiction, not from reality. Uh, but the, this world that uh, Werner Vinge imagines uh, takes Olin College to an extreme. So this is a world in which, uh, in a fictional high school, Students are doing the equivalent of uh, a year's worth of graduate level research in a few weeks' time. And they do this because they're, uh, this is a novel of the near future. Uh, the students are 
permanently wired in. They're sort of wearing their uh, wearable computers and on the grid all the time and communicating with their fellow students nearby and across the world and, uh, you know, sort of doing internet searches by uh, uh, blinking their eyebrows without having to type on anything and seeing the results projected. Uh, and in this world, uh, many of the adults who are coming from from the present day into this uh, world of maybe 20 years in the future are lagging behind and so the adults are sent to high school for remedial education because they can't catch up with these high school kids. Okay, so possible future, who knows if it's going to work out that way. Let's go back to Frank Rhodes uh, and he has some answers to this question of how important really is the social networking aspect. So. Is it just, if you put the kids in connection with each other and with some potential teachers, is that all they need, or do they, is the formal learning uh, uh, a vital part of uh, the equation? Rhodes said that uh, without community, knowledge becomes idiosyncratic. The lone learner studying in isolation is vulnerable to narrowness, dogmatism, and untested assumption. And learning misses out on being expansive and informed, contested by opposing interpretations, uh, and refined by alternative viewpoints. Without community, personal discovery is limited. Okay, so, so I think it's clear that this is important, but the question is, can it be the only thing, or can it be the main thing? So I think now we're ready to answer this question, uh, the challenge from Hal and, and from uh, Benjamin Bloom, of what education should be like, how we can achieve this two sigma effect, uh, let's try to synthesize these examples. And here's the best I've come up with. So uh, I think the best way to, to get to this 90% time on task uh, individualized learning is to concentrate on, the, on these points. Uh, one, center the education on engaging real world projects. Uh, so the kids uh, uh, approach their feelings about the project are probably more important than the actual words that are coming out of the teacher. And if they're excited about it, they're going to get better results. Uh, and it seems like a project-based approach is, is the best way to get them excited. Uh, exploring in teams seems to help. Uh, we can't afford individual tutors, but we can afford to put people together into teams. You get that for free, and you get much of these effects, of the two sigma effect of, of the tutors just by having people work together and help each other. Uh, so now the teachers are serving as facilitators and they can point to the theoretical knowledge when it's needed. Uh, and part of the point here is that it's needed much less than you think. Uh, that means that the teacher now is free to become a tutor because uh, the kids are doing most of the work, work, the teacher is acting as a facilitator, and so one teacher can be spread out over 30 students and still have enough time to cover them all. And finally, different students learn differently, uh, but let them figure it out from the world full of information. And don't try to create all the materials ahead of time and uh, make one set of materials for everybody to reach. So we've gone through these uh, transformations in the way information is, has been used. You know, we started off uh, with the lecture where there was one copy of the book in the world and the lecturer was reading it, the students was learning it. Uh, we got the revolution from Gutenberg that now the students all could read the book. And more recently, we've had the revolution of the internet where the students now can do two things. One, they can access all this information from around the world, uh, all the books and all this other kind of information. But more importantly, they can access each other. They can access fellow students and other people throughout the world. When we put that together, uh, that's a revolution that I think is, uh, comes the closest and is only, the only scalable solution to Bloom's challenge. So thank you, and uh, I'll stop lecturing and make the rest of this interactive. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Uh, we do have time for questions, and I hope that you're willing to take questions now. We've got um, a roving mic here, uh, and while you're thinking of what questions to ask, what we'll do is start with one of the questions that have come in from Illuminate. And 
It's from Panos in Edinburgh. Um, Web 2 technologies seem to be very busy social spaces and not necessarily educational and learning places. It appears that it makes students to be busy with things not related to learning but only to information sharing. Is this education? Any comments? So from my point of view, the, you know, the point of these uh, technologies is, is to connect the people, uh, not to be the only place where they connect. So uh, once you find, found the right person that uh, you want to work with, you, know, you can do that in person if you happen to live nearby. You can talk on the phone. Uh, you can use Web 1.0 technologies of uh, email or whatever you want. And I don't think you need to stay within the bounds of this social networking site or wherever you start it. I think it's making the connection that's important and what you do with it uh, then there's many options. Okay. Other questions? Yes, there's one, that, one there in the center of the hall. Um. This is sort of coming back to the Bloom paper, which is sort of one of my little hobby horses. Um, the, when, uh, at the end of the Bloom paper, he suddenly starts talking about, well, what about higher mental process things? And you sort of start to realize that all of the studies in the classroom that he was doing was on students learning how to do things that they're taught the exact process, step by step, of every single thing they have to do along the way. Uh, and you also discover quite how bad his control group was, was because he finds that setting homework makes a half a sigma improvement. Marking the homework makes another improvement. Actually teaching them stuff based on the, the, the stuff that you found out makes another improvement. Lots of educational technology, things like the cognitive tutors that uh, Dylan mentioned yesterday, focus quite heavily and shown learning games by doing the Bloom-like stuff where you train people in a set process. Something that very few systems seem to do is let students try out their own ideas and kind of react to that and sort of show them the consequences of, of their ideas. And it seems to me that's the only way that you can teach someone in situations where you don't already know the process. And for most interesting questions we'll come across in life, we don't already know the exact process we'll need to go through. Um, so uh, anyway, it was sort of just something that struck me. I wanted to make that point and see w whether you had any, any thoughts on it. Yeah, so, so I certainly agree with you. And, you know, I, I went through the same process. I, I read the paper. And at the end, I said, you know, the, this seems like it really applies to this kind of rote learning. But does it apply to more creative learning? And I said, oh, rats. Uh, Hal Abelson lied to me. I probably have to read more than one paper. <laughs> uh, so I, I was concerned about that. Uh, but I think you're right that uh, I think you know the important parts of learning are not in this this rote learning. I think Bloom did em emphasize that too much, and I think we want to move away from that. And I th I think that uh, as you point out, as you do that, uh, like the theme of this conference points out, you're losing control. You're no longer saying, uh, well, there's uh, this narrow path that you can follow, and we know exactly what the right and wrong answers are. And if you turn right or left, well, that's okay, because other people have gone down that path before, and we know how to follow you up. Uh, you start to get into areas where there are no black and white answers, and where the student may be exploring something where we haven't seen the answers before. And I guess part of uh, my message is that uh, you should embrace that rather than fear it, and be willing to go there, and trust that the students are going to learn something, it may be something new, it may be something uh, you as a teacher don't know about uh, or have to figure out as you go along, but go ahead and let them take that path. Okay, another question. We've got one down here. While the microphone's coming down, we've got a, another question via Illuminate from Adrian in Manchester um, referring to your Creative Commons search engine. He says, I'm wondering what criteria we use for ranking the Creative Commons open courseware materials, the one where MIT came out the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> I can't tell you the details. I can tell you it was built on uh, a Google custom search, which is a facility that we offer to anybody. Anybody can create a custom search. This one was done by this partnership with Creative Commons. So. Uh, there's two main things you can do. 
Uh, one is you can rule sites in or out. You know, you can say, uh, I only want to take results from the following set of sites that meet these criteria, or I don't want to take results from these other ones. And the other is you can influence the core Google rankings up or down by saying the following things are important to me as I rate these results. And so those are the tools that we provide. Now, I have no idea what this particular search has done in terms of how it's used those tools to provide the rankings. And are the criteria generally set by Google or um, in consultation? No. So how does that work? So the criteria are set by whoever publishes this custom search. Okay. So, right. So we give you the tools in which you can state, uh, you know, the policy that you want to implement, and then, but it's up to you to, to state that policy. Okay. Okay, I'm interested in the star performer idea and why that hasn't really taken off and what might help it to, or is it perhaps an outdated notion? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Which, which idea? The star performer and why there aren't star performers that you can um, get to easily. Yeah. So it's, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, you, you know, it just, it just seemed odd to me that in music we've gone... Uh, so far in that direction. Sure, you can still go to your local live performances, but most people, most of the time, they got their headphones in and they're, they're listening to the same top 40 groups. Or, or maybe they're not. You know, Maybe they have very varied choices, but they're listening to this recorded music rather than seeking out the local one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the universities had a lot of power and they kept things that way. Uh, until very recently, I think it was very uh, clunky to try to view these materials online. Uh, it's still, you know, it's better being there uh, in real life. You get the chance to ask questions and so on. Uh, but, you know, I've been in lecture halls that were twice the size of this one, and there's not a lot of interpersonal reaction going on there between the audience and the professor. So I'm not sure that you give up that much by uh, putting it online. And, of course, we could go so much more beyond that, right? So we could have... Uh, if you are going to go to this star model, you could have much higher production values uh, and put in animations and simulations and so on mixed in. Uh, it's expensive to do that. It seems like it's probably worthwhile doing, but it hasn't happened, and I don't know why. Um, one over there, and then one there. Thank you. Um, the start of your uh, talk caused me some amusement because you used two exactly of the same images that I used in my own professorial inaugural lecture some years ago, <laughs> uh, which was the image of the people asleep in a lecture theatre and the Socrates wandering around outdoors. Uh -huh. um, in my lecture, I used a third image, which was a group of Neanderthals who were driving mammoths off a cliff. <laughs> and actually, I think it was quite pertinent because what was going on was there was a whole bunch of young Neanderthals learning how to drive these mammoths off a cliff with a couple of old guys stood towards the back observing what they were doing. <laughs> um, and it struck me that that is actually how an awful lot of real learning works. You've got people getting stuck into real world problems, learning how with each other, with a bit of expertise on the side they can draw on. Mm -hmm. And I think the model that you put up towards the end is far closer to the Neanderthal than it is possibly to the Socratic. And indeed, you know, the tools we have now may, us, may enable us to adopt the, uh, a old and effective model of learning on what yeah. you think of that. Uh, that's, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of going back uh, to the Neanderthal. Uh, <laughs> but I did think of going back to, uh, you know, maybe the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, where we had the apprentice model. Uh, being more common, and so I, you know, I look at uh, Olin College, and seeing that as being something like the apprentice model, right? So uh, they're they're still in a college; they're not uh, owned by a corporation, uh, but they're on task, doing and and learning. And uh, it seems like that's a good model. And uh, you know, maybe we uh, we're we're trying to protect our young people too much by keeping them in school, keeping them segregated from the real world too long. I think, uh, you know, especially with all the influences they have now, they're, they're ready to grow up earlier and we should have them out there 
if not in a formal apprentice program, at least something that's approaching it where they're interacting with the real world more. We've got another question there, and then one at the back, and then that's, that'll have to be it. Uh, thanks for the uh, refreshing lecture, Peter. Uh, I'm Kanishk Bedi from uh, Universitas 21 Global. And uh, uh, I have noticed that uh, there's a trend uh, in which uh, people have started, uh, uh, you know, uh, differentiating between a search engine and a knowledge repository like Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has become uh, such a huge volume of knowledge. And uh, there's a trend uh, in which people would like to go to Wikipedia to search out the knowledge they want uh, rather than going to uh, Google for searching information of any sort. Mm -hmm. So I uh, do, uh, do you think that uh, Google is uh, facing competition in future is or uh, about to face competition from future from Wikipedia? And what are the strategies uh, which Google uh, would like to have in order to maybe venture into the same kind of a knowledge creation uh, format rather than knowledge searching format of business? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we love uh, Wikipedia. We're, we're uh, uh, you know, big fans of theirs, and uh, I forget the exact statistics, but I, th I think we give them something like a third of their traffic. So uh, people are going them to them directly, but a, a substantial portion of people who get to them are coming to them through us. And, uh, you know, I, I don't really see that as a threat of people going away if, if they know they want to go to Wikipedia, I'm happy for them to go directly there, but most people I think will continue to go through these more general sources because they know they don't want all their information from one place, they want to have a choice. Uh, and so I, I think people are going to continue to do that. Okay, we've got one last question at the back there. Yeah, my, my question is a kind of follow-up to that. But uh, you showed us the, uh, the Google VLE at the start, made a comment about that. Uh, and um, one of the things I feel is that um, the Google techniques and algorithms provide us with too much information. Um, I'm wondering if you see users and user-generated content as a way of providing more refined and sophisticated search techniques. Okay, so the question is, is there too much information and can users help refine that? Uh, so so I think the, the problem with too much information is that there, there really is that much information. It's not just a problem of uh, overloading people with the presentation. So, you know, we'll show you 10 results and we'll say this is 1 to 10 out of a million. Uh, nobody really cares that there's a million results and they're not going to go to the end and look at that. Uh, so the results are, are up there and really the question is how much time do they have to investigate this area? How much time are they willing to put in, and can we find the good stuff for them uh, in that allocated amount of time? And given that, I, I think that there is room for uh, user-generated uh, commentary to help that process. And you know, to an extent, uh, Google has always been driven by user-generated content. So there are users who happen to be webmasters who publish material. <laughs> There uh, are other users who are webmasters who link between the material, and that provides the uh, sort of votes that we go on to, to, uh, to judge appropriateness. We also go by looking at our, our users' traffic to uh, judge what's important and so on. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's done by algorithms, but all these algorithms have as their inputs actions that ultimately come from the user. Now, I think we can use, uh, in addition to the, those sources that we're already using, we can use some more explicit ones of people voting. Uh, yes, this is a good site for this topic or for this keyword or for this area. And getting uh, more people than just the people who uh, traditionally have had access as webmasters, trying to open up that more, uh, democratize it more so that other people can put in their voices as well and have them count it. And so that's an area that we're certainly looking at. That's all, unfortunately, that we've got time for. I'd like to thank Peter Norvig very much for an entirely appropriate and stimulating and thought-provoking talk and entirely free of PowerPoint bullet points as well. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed.
for rounding off the conference in such a stimulating way.